Pay attention real quick. We're um, so we're going to start on time here in a couple of minutes because we have to be out of here too because the library closes and we want to be respectful of the fact that they need to get their operation shut down. So we do have a hard stop at two o'clock. Um, so Maybe we, even a couple minutes. Yeah, I think we did that last time. We ended up like five minutes before just so we could clean up because we're going to need to do like a joint. So if everybody could at the end do a joint effort, put the chairs, whoever's left, stack chairs up, and we'll stick them over. Or, or I think there's kind of more when we came in. So we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Shut up, Siri, shut up. Um, uh, but, um, so yeah, I mean, I got like 12.29, so. I just want to let you all know that, because we do have to, again, five, about five until we we'll probably cut out, okay? All the, the reps and center and renter, if she shows up, I haven't seen her yet, but. Um, She's planning on coming. Yeah, she said she was. Um, and uh, still, Chris Matos isn't here yet, but. Um, we can roll it if they pop in. We'll, we can let them inject. But we're, the format we did last couple times that worked well is each of the four the, the reps are here now and then. Oh, there's Chris Irene. Matos, if he shows it, there's Irene and Senator Renner. Everybody will go through and just give you a little rundown of what they've been doing in their committees and their body of exactly. the House or the Senate if they so choose. And then, um, and then we'll just do a Q&A. It's relatively informal. We just ask you to raise your hand. And, Keep it, you know. Yeah, keep be, it I think there's the topics today uh, uh, come with some emotion sometimes, so we're going to try to just kind of obviously keep it respectful. Let the person that's talking so finish talking, so try not to talk over each other. And it would be only got one ear. You got one ear. Yeah. 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 So yeah. yeah. Keep some kind of a format going today. And to the gentleman who's filming, can I ask who who are you affiliated with? Sure. Uh, my name is John Brabant. I'm John Brabant, and I work for Vermonters for a Clean Environment, and I'm the Legislative a Regulatory Affairs Director at VCE. So I'm filming this. Um, we will upload it on YouTube, so folks who couldn't make it will be able to witness what was said today and keep informed. Okay. You bet. Um, yeah, so I've got 1230 right on the nose. I mean, no special order. We can start with Chris and or no senator is there. We can start there and just work. I could go last until unless we we'll give time for Chris Matos gets here. He can be last guy. That's exactly how it happened last time. <laughs> I, I went, I went uh, first last time, so I'll, I'll go last this time. But I will pass on a sign up sheet if people sure. want to sign in. That's helpful. And I also have. Uh, There's Chris. Chris. Hey, you're on. Hey, <laughs> you're on. Uh, we're just asking to hear from well, so I, well, you want to go in reverse? I can start go that way. I don't care where we go. I, I can keep this out. Um, yeah, so I'm Chris Taylor, uh, represented, uh, represent uh, the Chin and Franklin portion of uh, so you'll be able to hear us down the middle and a little bit. Um, and I'm on the Education Committee. Uh, we've been doing some work in the Education Committee. We saw uh, S56, which is the child care uh, bill that's coming through. Uh, that is now, I believe, over in Wayne's Remain. So Chris Michaels will be able to talk a little bit on some of the stuff that's going on with that in there. Um, the education committee only specifically looked at the education aspect of it, which talked about the pre-kindergarten uh, uh, and the pupil waiting. So we were able to kind of take a look at that. When we first got it, um, there was a study uh, set to start looking at pre-K for only four-year-olds within the public schools. Uh, while we had it, we had to kind of broaden that. One of my main concerns with that was that when we started talking about only four-year-olds in pre-K, that was set to eliminate the services that three-year-olds are currently getting right now, which is 10 hours of pre-K service. And I thought that was kind of a step backwards if we're gonna, if we're gonna look at taking away services from a specific age. So I think we, we passed that on to the Ways and Means. I know they're doing some a lot of work on it and a lot of amendments, so I don't know if all that still stands. Um, we also worked on a bill, it's uh, H, no, S138, which is a school safety bill. We just passed that on a committee, so it's going to hit the floor this week. Um, it talks about making sure that, we, that every school has a visit, visitor management system. All schools have locked doors, um, as well as the contentious kind of part about this bill was a section that um, now mandates every school to have a behavior uh, threat assessment team included within their school uh, to look at anything that could possibly maybe red flag a uh, mass casualty um, event or 
harm to other students. Um, so we spent a lot of time looking at that. Um, what we wound up doing after hearing testimony, there was a lot of different ideas about behavior assessment teams. So what we did is we actually took a step back and let the Agency of Education, Vermont Legal Aid, and the Vermont School Board Association kind of have some separate meetings on their own to hash out their differences and come back with some language that actually works for all, all of them, which they did. And uh, I'm reading through it. I think it's a really good plan to move forward with. So that's going to hit the floor this week, and I'm hoping that everybody supports it on the floor. That's the education committee. Yeah, so Chris and I share uh, a committee assignment of Ways and Means. Um, Could you introduce yourselves? Chittenden 25. I'm sorry? Could you all introduce yes. yourselves by name? I'm Julia Andrews. I represent Chittenden 25, which is a portion of Milton and Westford. Uh, I sit on Ways and Means with Chris Malos, and we kind of share responsibilities for this group to report out, and it's my turn, so I'll start. And Chris can backfill anything that I, uh, I miss. So, um, as Rep. Taylor <coughs> said, we have spent quite a bit of time on the child care bill, um, which is exciting. I hope, I, I feel like this is a, a bill that has um, tripartisan support. Oops. And what our, we try not to monkey too much with the policy decisions made in education and in human services, but really more to look at the funding, which is our purview. So um, because we feel like this bill has a broad societal positive impact, we're really trying to find ways to fund the child care system with a very broad base that hits everybody in a smaller way. So, um, and then also to look at levers so that people who are at the lowest socioeconomic um, pieces are not impacted so that it's affordable. Um, we also had, I don't, we didn't really do much with the housing bill, was it S100? I never get the numbers. S100, which is the housing bill. Um, there was some really modest financial <coughs> impacts on that, but because it's such a big deal, I just thought I'd mention it. Um, we've also spent, actually this week we had something really great come across our plates. Uh, the treasurer, PA check came in and talked to us about a new retirement savings plan called Vermont Saves. And Vermont Saves is something that will help employers who don't offer like a 401k or retirement benefits to offer it because it wouldn't actually be an employer run item, it would be run by the treasurer's office. So um, I'm personally really excited about it because I feel like um, one of the large groups of people that live in poverty in our communities is people who are older and at, you know at that point they're really hamstrung to earn any money so hopefully this is a program that can help people um, save for their future um, when Which they, 135 that was really yeah I never know I, mean, I just I know because we just had it in our <coughs> community, we yeah. voted it out yeah. so it seems like that had very strong support um, from from all parties um, we've also been looking at the universal Sur service fund so Universal Service Fund, Every if you have a phone, you get a little fee on your phone bill that is goes to the Universal Service Fund. And right now, that is structurally not generating as much revenue that is necessary to fund the things that it uh, is required to fund. And that's particularly important because one of those things is the E911 system. So we've been trying to figure out ways to restructure the Universal Service Fund to make sure that E911 is funded correctly. And I think we can all imagine why that's an important thing to do. <coughs> and then another, like, this is like classic, really wonky ways and means stuff. We've been looking at TIF districts. Um, so TIF districts are like, what is it? Tax incremental financing. Tax incremental financing. Thank you. Um, and we've been trying to clarify some of the guidelines for uh, the board that oversees TIF districts, which is the um, Vermont Economic Progress Council. Pepsi. <laughs> um, and so just, I think 
what we're trying to do is strengthen their open meeting laws primarily, and then there's some places where their uh, responsibilities really needed to be clarified to make sure that um, that board can run the best as possible, best way possible. And in that same bill, there are two towns, um, city, Barry City and the town of Hartford, that asked for an exp uh, expanded TIF district. Um, timeline because during the pandemic their projects basically came <coughs> to a complete halt. Um, I'm sure as many people in this room know the um, you know getting construction projects done right now or for the past couple of years for that matter has been extremely challenging so we did expand those districts by a couple of years so they could finish their projects up successfully. What did I miss Chris? Anything? No I think I'm rep Chris Matos I serve on ways and means with Julia, um, <laughs> two should have sat together. <laughs> Julia did a great job. Um, basically, this time of year, we're looking at big bills that come through Ways and Means, and also a bunch of random things that <coughs> come through that might have a small impact or a big impact, depending on what the bill is. Um, I reported the transportation bill this past week, and it had a uh, fifteen thousand dollar difference. Uh, just so everybody knows, the little little stickers that you put on your license plate, those are going away. It saves the state about $15,000. And it'll be an option where you can have your registration on your phone. Or you can so that means you can lower the DM fees instead of asking for 20%? <laughs> uh, this bill was uh, taken out. Those DMV fees were taken out of the T-bill. So that's actually the So the other 20% that you're, you guys have asked, I don't know if you voted yes or not on it, but to raise DMV fees 20% when the DMV didn't even ask for it. So you're saving money and then you're raising right. fees 20%. Right, going somewhere else. Where's go. it going? Everybody, go one at a time. We're going to do the, we'll do the I'm, I'm, Honestly, Josie, guys. I'm done with one at a time. <coughs> I've, I'm so upset with all of you here today. I came here to yell and scream. Well, you know other people are And I understand too. you are, we're and that's fine. You? That's fine. You can no. yell and scream all you want. Let's I don't just, care. I'm mad because Miss Andrews here sat there and told us on Sean. S5 Sean. during the election. No, no, oh, Josie, I'm here talking. That you agreed not, not to vote yes on S5. I never. You did. Never. You rate in on your Westford, folks. Go online, look up the Let's Westford debate. Your hand. Everybody else here raise. wants to talk. No. The debate. Who are you? you? Said, Who are you? What is your name? My name is Sean Tatro. All right. You're the guy with the bad spelling. Do continue. Yes, I got bad spelling. Well, guys. But I'm going to tell you, she said, but you said darn well, Sean, can we just keep going around the room and then we'll question? Well, you guys talk and then we never get a chance. No, we'll get there. No, we're going to have a chance for everyone to talk. We probably got five, ten more minutes, Sean, we'll, we'll have right at it. We'll do whatever we need to do. We know we're going to talk about this fight. We'll get to it. Thanks, Sean. Um, so that wraps up. Stickers going away on your license plates. Um, and I'll let you speak about Kirkman. Okay, I'm on the Ag Committee, and um, we've had some cool bills. And anyway, I'm just going to quickly sum up. Uh, one that just passed by an overwhelming margin was H81, which is the right to repair, which allows farmers and foresters to have access to all of the manuals, the codes, and um, parts at a fee, but it's going to be a negotiated fee to um, be able to fix their own equipment without having to take it to the dealer. And this also allows independent dealers and independent repair shops to expand and get a little more creative and be able to help people. So we might be able to have some more repair shops out here, especially in Grand Isle on the island, so you don't have to haul your tractor, pay that haulage fee, and you can fix your equipment yourself. And what I love about this bill, it is, a, it is utterly a bipartisan bill, equal support, it was sponsored by uh, two Republicans and a bunch of Democrats, and it uh, everyone voted yes except two people uh, on a roll call vote. So that was wonderful. Universal school meals, which came out of our committee and the Ed Committee, um, <coughs> uh, came out of the Senate. It's been voted on. They cleared it, um, and now we'll see what the governor says. Um, H two hundred five is a bill that is now in the Senate. I haven't quite, I think it's about to, get, I think it's in their appropriations. <coughs> Actually, it might have been there already. Um, and that H205 exists to allow farmers who are looking at needing to either diversify or transition how they're farming, what they're farming. So if you're doing dairy cow, dairy cows, 
and it's not working, it'll allow you to shift to beef cows, or it'll say, you know what, you want to start, you want to start farming hemp? We will help you. It's small, fifteen thousand dollar grants. We'd asked for more money, um, and we wanted two hundred fifty thousand. We got cut down to three fifty, and then the Senate got a hold of it, and now it's one hundred fifty thousand. It's a one year, basically a one year pilot, and we'll see how that works. Um, S one fifteen is miscellaneous agricultural subjects. Also, just so you guys know, if it says H and then the number it came out of the House, if it says S and then the number it started in the Senate. S-115 is basically shoring up the powers of what the Agency of Agriculture Food and Markets are able to do, and it's tightening up some old language. Um, the one slightly contentious thing about that is the um, stormwater runoff, and that um, is going to take more time than we have to talk about right now. The other thing I just want to mention is two things I'm really proud of. Um, for the big housing bill, I had created an amendment with two other people for eviction diversion that was creating a fund for folks who were facing eviction. Most people, 70% of people who face eviction are owe less than $3,000. And this fund would allow them, and they're people who live paycheck to paycheck, whose income, 50% or more of their income goes to their rent. It's designed to help folks like that who get behind because they, have, they need new brakes for their car. A tractor brings. It doesn't take much. In a second, Sean, I will totally yeah. get to you. Um, and it, it has been morphed now in this new bill, um, and it's been woven into other things. So I will learn more about that <coughs> this week on Monday when it gets presented. And then the last thing was for S5, I was one of the, the people really beating the drum to include mobile homes in S5 because they were not in S5. And now they are, and that was an amendment that, that we got added. Um, and you will see that. So that just 30% of our housing stock in this district are mobile homes. So I wanted to make sure that mobile home owners were protected. And a lot of mobile homes we know probably can't do heat pumps, but we can weatherize them. And that will help people save. Um, and that just feels good to represent some, some, some of the folks who really need more help than other folks. Um, and that's, that's it for me. Sean, you did have a question, though. Yeah, uh, where's that money going to? Is it going to go to the tenant, that $3,000 you're talking about? Or is that <coughs> going to? It's going to, it's so going to go to the landlord. landlord. So that's going to bypass the tenant, go straight to the landlord who they own. And that's why it's a diversion program, because you're going to be working with lawyers. And it's one of the, what, what we really liked about this program was it fully represented landlords. So I noticed in a lot of housing bills, landlords had sort of been demonized, and this bill goes a long way to undemonize that and realize that there are two parties at play, and the money will be decided on very quickly. It's like a 10-day turnaround time, and the back rent will be paid right to the landlord, not to the tenant. Now, on the S-5 that you just said, sorry, I'll raise my hand again for that, and uh, you had mentioned, uh, what's the clause <coughs> in for the... Uh, trailers, mobile homes and stuff like that. Are you saying that those people aren't going to be expected to have to put heat pumps in? Yet you really want to see them more weatherize their homes instead of putting heat pumps in those? You know, th there, there is the, the acknowledgement that mobile homes are a unique housing stock and not all mobile homes. Some mobile homes you can put in a heat pump. Bear in mind, no one's going to be asked to put in anything they don't want to put in. That is yeah. rule number one. No one's going to be forced to change how they heat their home. But mobile homes are notoriously leaky, and they are not the most tight homes. So this is just a way to start ensuring that the folks who live in mobile homes, that at least they can be weatherized and stand a better chance of having their, their, their fuel bill come down because so, they're using less heat. So S5 isn't designed to make a fuel provider, whether it's fuel oil, propane, or natural gas, to get their clients off from those fossil fuels into electric heat or else lose the or have to pay higher costs with credits. That's not what S5 is designed? Yes, it does. I'm not quite sure I understand your question. How is S5 <coughs> designed? How is it designed in your eyes? How is S5 designed? I would like to actually pick that up when everyone else is done because that's okay. going to be a larger conversation. Yeah, and I want to make sure Michael. One just one second, yeah. And I'd like Michael and Irene to have a chance to speak and then we can really dig into S5. Sounds good. Cool. Okay. 
Uh, Michael Morgan, represent Grand Isle County, West Milton. Uh, it's called Grand Isle Chittenden District, is what we're formerly known as. Um, I'm in the Government Operations and Military Affairs uh, Committee. Um, so, a couple big things that we're charged with are town charters, <coughs> which are um, basically a tool for towns to be able to make big changes, big picture changes in what they do. Um, for instance, I was working with one of our towns the last couple of weeks. We've been going back and forth with trying to get a local option tax. Like if you go to the towns of Williston, um, I think St. Albans has it north of us, and then you've got Essex, and a few of South Burlington. So you, uh, Colchester has it, like if anybody goes to Costco, you look on your bill, you're going to see the standard for anything that's taxable, 6% and then you'll see an additional 1% <coughs> for that town, which in the case of Colchester, or Costco is Colchester. So what happens with that extra penny on every dollar of taxable goods is 30% uh, of it goes back to the state for the administration of that fund, and the seven, other 70% the town gets to keep and do as they choose. And, they, and there, there are some guidelines on what we can do with it. Um, so that's a big thing we do, and that, that's just one example of what charters do. Uh, but all charters go through our, our committee and then are passed to Senate for their approval. Um, somebody just talked about process. I'll, I'll give you a quick overview on that. So yes, H, H dot XXX, House Bill, S dot XXX, Senate Bill. Um, House passes a bill out of a committee. It goes from a committee to the greater body of the 150 people, if it gets voted in the affirmative, it then moves over to the comparable to the Senate and they assign it to their comparable sister committee in the Senate. They review it, they go through their process, they take in, they do interrogations, they do testimonials. Then if they pass in the affirmative out of their body, then um, it with the way that was written by the House, it's done and can go to the governor. And I'll get to that in just a sec. But if they amend it, then it comes back to the House because we have to go, yeah, that was our original intent, but let's see if we like what you did as the Senate. So it could literally be like a ping pong table back and forth between the bodies. In theory, generally speaking, it goes, you'll see them go House, in the case of, of us, House, Senate, Senate back to the House with a possible amendment. Yep, gay barely looks good. Affirmative vote goes to the governor. So now it sits in the governor's desk. Uh, in this case, he can do three things with it. He could sign it, which means it goes into a law, the effective date written in the bill. He could uh, let it go into effect without signing it, which would be an indication of, mm, I'm not crazy about the bill, but I'll let it go. Um, or he can veto it. And if it gets vetoed, it comes back to the two bodies, the House and the Senate. And then to sustain a governor's veto or to override, whichever way you want to look at it. So for his, his veto to be upheld, Either if either of the two bodies um, doesn't get two thirds of all its members, in the case of the House, if there were 51 people um, that voted to sustain the governor's veto, it, his veto was upheld. And in the Senate, it would be 11 of 30. Um, so uh, that's kind of the process. And if anybody wants more detail, I don't want to eat up time getting any great deal in that detail on that. So some big things we've been working, like I said, charters, we've done a ton of those. Um, I don't even know what the count is, probably at least a dozen by now, if not more, not more than that, probably. Um, the, we took some testimony just in the past week on S39 um, on legislative pay increasing. Um, and I don't know the fate of that because it's kind of stalled out at the moment. So. Uh, that was in my committee from the Senate, so it was S-39, again, a Senate bill passed the Senate, came to our Government Operations Committee in the House, um, but it's kind of in stall mode is what I'm going to assign it. Um, next, uh, dispatch came to our committee, because again, Government Operations, Military Affairs, mm -hmm. pretty broad breadth of things it covers. So dispatching, and you're probably not all familiar with it, I see it also as a selectman, I know we, the town of Milton, for instance, get our services from the town of St. Albans for dispatching for all EMS services, fire, rescue, uh, policing. Um, so throughout the state, it's the map is really interesting if you look at how did, does the ambulance get called to go to the town of Westford, how does the ambulance get called to the town of Milton, how does the ambulance get called to the town of Grand Isle, uh, and so forth. 
it's real, it's a real splotchy map. So what we're trying to do is get A, some uniformity, B, um, a little better coverage from the areas that don't have it, because that's not something you want to have a lapse in coverage on. It's sometimes, you know, generally speaking, a lot of cases it's lives at risk and you want those services quick and fast. So we're working that, uh, there's a bill we're working on, I'm sorry, I feel to grab the number on it, but we're working on that right now in my committee. So we got about a week left-ish, so anything that's gotta get done is gonna get wrapped up pretty quick and moved and then and be uh, finished. Um, next, uh, I throw out um, uh, an interesting, the one that went through was a couple weeks ago, we wrapped up S17, again, it came from the Senate, originated there, then the House, it was called a strike all amendment, when a strike all means you take, literally take the bill and it's got a big red Z through every page of the bill. It doesn't mean you squash the bill in its entirety. In that case, you took the ideas of the bill that came from the Senate and kind of reworded, re kind of remassaged it, and sent out a bill. Um, and the reason that came to be, and it'll, it'll touch on the last thing I'm going to talk about, um, is because there's been some, as you've all seen in the news, there's been a little turmoil in that world in a couple of places. Thankfully, in the counties of Chittenden County and Grand Isle County, that's, we don't have that problem. Um, we have a good sheriff organization in both counties that we all represent. Well, um, I'm, I know Irene touches uh, Franklin County, but so she's part of. <laughs> Sorry, Irene. There's, there's some things going on up there in Franklin County. Stop not doing. in Fairfax. Let's just but, right, right, right. But, uh, um, so, but, uh, so, it basically puts some guardrails on how their duties are performed. I won't go into to ad nauseum detail because it's very, it's very involved. Um, and, but the key was, for me at the end of it, that the Vermont Sheriff's Association had 100% buy-in in the end, and they took a vote. It was 13-0 of all their sheriffs in the state, so they were on board with it. So it's a good thing the way it came out. And um, last, um, tied directly to that, we had a joint hearing with the House Judiciary and House uh, Government Office and Military Affairs Committee, so my committee and the Judiciary Committee, um, to put together a, and if you've been watching the news, uh, basically essentially putting together an impeachment panel for two individuals in Franklin County, the state's attorney and the um, sheriff there. Uh, and so we're more to follow on that, watch that in the news. Um, it's going to be interesting, I guess, is the way I'll put it. <laughs> I'll leave it at. Um, so, uh, it, there will be a committee of seven appointed that will work on that. The way basically that process works is that committee does its investigation. And essentially, the, the Senate, I guess the best way I could put it, becomes kind of like the, the judge on it in the end. And it's the final ruling authority on whether any action is taken or not. And there's not a lot of precedent or case law, if you would, on this. Because the last time this was tried was back in 1976 with a sheriff, and it um, ended up not um, being uh, I'm trying to think the right word. Uh, yeah, they were well, they were acquitted by the Senate. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Like, yeah, they were they were acquitted in the Senate. They got the House said, yeah, we think there's a problem. The Senate said, mm, we don't there's quite enough. So then it reaches all the way back into the 17 and 1800s. So we don't have a lot of history on it. So it's kind of breaking new ground, and we'll I guess. I can Again, I'll use the word interesting. And um, I could go into several other bills, but I think we've got, we're beating up a bunch of time, and I think you all want to yeah, that's ask a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Is it related to something I got here, Patricia? Did I just talk well, about it? Well, I thought she was uh, military, not taxing. DOA, debt on arrival. Um, still sitting on the wall on its committee of jurisdiction. Yeah. I'll go to Senator Renner. Thank you, Irene Renner. I live in Essex. I represent this district, which is Milton, Fairfax, Westford, and rural Essex. It's called Chittenden North. And uh, like Josie, one of my committees is agriculture, so I've worked on some similar bills, um, including universal meals, which the Senate has voted out recently, which provides breakfast and lunch to every public school student in Vermont, which is very exciting because we've heard so many good things from teachers and school nurses and parents and all kinds of folks about how much better children perform and how much better they behave when they actually get two meals first thing in the day. Um, and it's just been a really wonderful thing and we've had a lot of support throughout the State House 
and tripartisan for that expense. Um, and the federal government is changing the rules, so although we set aside $29 million for it, we're hoping it'll cost maybe even half that once the new rules. Fingers crossed. Uh, my other committee is institutions where we put together the capital bill. This was $122 million to provide maintenance renovations and so forth for 230 buildings that the state owns, including one building that the state owns, which is not in Vermont. The Big E has a Vermont hall yep. from West Springfield, Massachusetts, <laughs> and it is almost 100 years old, mm -hmm. and it needs a couple million dollars of renovation. So that's where some of the money is going. So if you go to the Big E, those are your tech dollars that work also. I uh, just want to go over a couple of really interesting bills that we had. One of them, um, as a Senate that we approved, ending child marriage. I don't know if you're familiar with this issue, but apparently um, in order not to pay child support, some folks marry off their daughters. And it only takes one person to do that. And once their daughter's married off, if she's not 18, it's not her decision of whether to get married. So Vermont, along with I believe eight other states at this point, has passed a law that says you must be 18 to marry and that way it is the young woman's choice to get married and she cannot be married off in the way that this has been happening. And it's unfortunate that that's um, where that comes from. If, if you think to yourself, well, I got married, I was 16 and I was in love. That's not what we're trying to prevent. We're trying to prevent abuse and um, keep intact the woman's right to choose who she spends the rest of her life with. Um, we have put forth a bill to ban PFOS. There's a whole family of chemicals, as you may know. Teflon is among you know, the results of, of these com compounds that have been put into our environment. They're in our bodies now. And we want to minimize PFOS in textiles, cosmetics, athletic fields, feminine products. You know, If fewer of these are put into products, maybe fewer of them will end up in the environment. They used to be in ski wax, I believe. Ski wax. There's so many. So many. It's an astroturf. Dental floss. Yeah, I mean, it's everywhere, right? And so we're trying to, you know, um, do what we can to ban the PFOS family of chemicals. Um, there were some interrogation techniques that have been used. Um, they're still used on adults, but they were being used on minors. And, and we thought that was wrong, that law enforcement agents should not be misrepresenting who they are or the truth when they're interrogating a younger person. So we've outlawed that. Um, protection for medication abortions. In many states in the US now, they're outlawing methylpristone. We attached to, I believe it was H89, an amendment that says, as long as a form of medication abortion was approved by the FDA as of the 1st of January of this year, it cannot be outlawed by anyone. And it will, you know, so meaning the federal government, whoever. Um, we put out a bill to reduce driver's license suspensions. What was found was that people can go to work, and of course we need all the people we can in the workforce right now. There are so many jobs that need people to work in them. Driver's license suspensions for things like moving violations. These are not, you're not DUIs, but people who just, you know, ran a stoplight or something, get their license suspended because they couldn't pay the fine. So there's legislation now at play to reduce the suspensions for moving violations so that people can keep their licenses, keep going to work, and keep providing the services that are needed to keep our society going. We put out a bill to reduce overdoses where people can go to a certain place and have drugs tested. You know, this is just a kind of a wild idea to some of us. But with the kinds of contamination people are finding, we don't want people to die you know, because they have a drug addiction. So there are going to be <coughs> places to provide the government signs this bill where you can get drugs tested before you take them. Um, expanding end of life choice for patients who are terminally ill. There are folks who come to Vermont from elsewhere who have wanted to take their lives. Their lives are clearly ending. They want to end the pain. Um, now people can come to Vermont to end their life through following the procedure that Vermonters have been able to follow for some time now. Um, I'll stop there, but just to give you a broad range of just some of the interesting bills that we encounter in the course of being in the legislature that we get up and meet on and we have conversations about and uh, I think it's really interesting. Thank you. Sean. Can I ask a procedural question before sure. we get started? Mm -hmm. sure. Are there any other um, legislators in the room other than those who represent Milton, and if so, 
what districts are they from? He's just asking if there's any other legislators. There's one. Yes, so um, I invited Gabrielle Stebbins here from Burlington. Gabrielle sits on <coughs> energy and, I'm sorry, I always get it backwards, environment and energy, which is the committee in the House that um, primarily worked on S5. Understanding that there are a lot of questions on this bill, Gabrielle, I think, is like a real expert in this. She's dug into every detail. So I invited her here today to help people really understand what's in the bill. Just over here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Irene, I actually wanted to personally thank you. I know I can be very hard and I can come out rough a lot, but I felt that you set party politics aside when voting no on S5, and I thought that was heroic of you. And I want to let you know I thank you very much for that. And I think, you know, in my opinion, if I was to ever vote for somebody, you have my vote next time around for that. There's bills that we've argued on and probably not agreed on, but, and we will again. you know, and there will be, obviously. <laughs> but that took a lot of strength for you to do that, and I appreciate that Thank very you. much. Well, we have another vote on Tuesday, so if you're, if you're following, oh, yeah, if you're yeah, following yeah. the sports, yeah, Tuesday know, is the override vote. So, thanks. Well, I'll see you up there Monday anyway, so not you, but. Should we stick right with the S5 topic for now? And we, we have another yeah. Was, Oh, you did, I'm uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, um, Peter St. Clair from uh, South Hero. In the same line, I'd like to thank Josie for um, standing up and voting for S5 and representing a uh, large part of her constituency who are previously concerned about climate change. And in this climate, and I mean political climate, it is sometimes it takes a lot of courage to do this because there's so many people who are, um, are angry and are kind of threatening the uh, peaceful dialogue in issues like this. But I have a question for um, Representative Morgan about this. If I may. Sure. So Governor Scott um, uh, vetoed the S-5. Correct. And he was saying that he believed that uh, before you pass a law, you have to be um, show Clearly, you have to clearly communicate both the burdens and the benefits of that law. And I think that would also apply to people who vote against the law or who, or who veto. <coughs> and I think that um, the governor in vetoing this has not made it clear what the burdens are on the entire population of Vermont and the entire world because they're not he's not talking about the grievous. Uh, consequences that not stopping the combustion and uh, and the extraction of fossil fuels will cause. And right now we're at 1.2% uh, above the industrial uh, centigrade above the industrial era. And that's higher temperature than has ever existed in the history of the human race on the planet. And we're talking about stopping at 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade above it. And those are conditions that bring us into a whole new world. So it's really imperative that, um, and it's really hard, I think, for people to get their heads around what this is exactly going to mean. I just had a, a grandson born uh, three weeks ago. Oh, and people coming into the world right now are going to be faced with really horrible conditions unless all of us start doing everything possible to do it. So I was going to ask the question is, what would you say um, <coughs> you could do or what do you propose that's going to replace the small bit of help that the S5 was going to Sure. Um, so I, for me, that's fairly easy. The governor said all along, he's been very adamant about the fact and I'll, and I'll actually use something I was asked on the campaign trail last fall, too, with that, is a major component for him is, and it was alluded to earlier, I think, with mobile homes, is weatherization of homes is one of the greatest, <coughs> the greatest mobile, excuse me, let me back up, the, mo the weatherization of homes, period, in Vermont, 
is one of the, the biggest heat sink losses we have. And his his big focus has been, and he's and he's put his money where his mouth is and pushing money to those ways of weather radiation of older homes um, to stop that heat loss. And I'll give you an example. Last year, I was contacted by a gentleman from South Erie. He goes, hey, he goes, what are your, what are your thoughts on electrification? I said, it has its place. And he says, I'll, and I said, I'll tell you where I'm coming from. He says, I own a Prius as my day-to-day -day commuter car, but I own my diesel truck that I love to drive when I need to do work and I got things I want to do and I don't want to be told what I got to do with that. Where do you stand with that? And I said, it has its place. I think the electrification has in vehicles has its place in um, in our urban centers, certainly. And if you've got commutes that are reasonable that you know that you can make without having to recharge, et cetera. Um, anyway, I just said, so I said, to me, there's a balance there. And then that's, and that's, and I think all along that's what the governor said. I would agree with him that he said, again, go back to weatherization. That to him is huge, it's critical, there's a big piece of it. But we can't, but what we can't do with S5 is punish Vermonters that aren't able to be in a new position to do it. I don't understand because S5 is actually going to incentivize uh, fossil fuel importers to do things like weatherization, and it's not really, a, it's not forcing Vermonters to do anything that they don't want to do. So well, eventually it will. Eventually it will. And it, well, so, and, and we may have to agree to disagree on that, Peter, and that's fine. But anyway, the, that is, the, right now, because of, there's so many unknowns, that is a big problem for why the governor is dead set against that. There's so many unknown components to that that can't be answered right now. So, but anyway, I'll let other... Can I rebut you for just a quick second? You usually do. <laughs> <laughs> we disagree. You don't need to point it out every time. Uh, and that's never going to change. Um, this bill, as it's written, isn't... First of all, nothing can happen until 2025. <laughs> it is true. Please read the language of the bill. I have it. it that is absolutely true. So the governor it, there are going to be study committees. The public, the, the PUC, they're going to study this and they're going to come up with a plan that makes sense. And then and only then, in 2025, will the new legislature vote on it and implement that plan. That is the only way this can happen. And the thing that a lot of people are forgetting is, and I forget exactly the section, it's 8, 812 section 4. Um, there, is a, there is up to a three year pause on this if it turns out, my God, we blew it. We got this wrong. This is too expensive. There aren't enough clean heat credits. This isn't working. We can pause this for three years, regroup, study again and start over. All we did, all my yes vote did on S5 was saying, I want more information. That is all that it did. Well, and it's couched as uh, <coughs> a study. Members of the own committee of jurisdiction said it's, it's not a study. It's a study, but everything else is moving along. Right. Yeah, you have the, you have the public utilities commission. Yeah. No one, no, no one's heating oil, no one's fuel bill is going to change between now and 2025 because of S5. Your heating bill is going to change as it has in the last 18 months. If you heat with oil, you've gone up two dollars a gallon. We had nothing to do with that. That is the market rate economy. We're trying to protect Vermonters from that by studying this and seeing what can happen. Please know, the last thing, I don't want someone telling me you've got to get a heat pump. I have a heat pump. It's not totally working in my house. We're not going to make you do that. Could I weatherize my house? That would be awesome. So, but no one's going to force you to change how you heat your home. Please know that. And you need, all of you need to know, I was on the fence with this for weeks and weeks, and I agonized, and I dug in, and I talked to Gabrielle, who really helped me, and I talked to Laura Sebelia, who presented the bill on the floor, and I said, explain this to me, because I'm not getting the language. And they walked me through, and that is the only reason I felt comfortable saying yes, because it obligates us to nothing but learning more. And, and then I'll, I'll add to that, <coughs> so hearing from, speaking of which, hearing from constituency, because um, that's who we answer to, uh, is the fact that um, 
in my district, I received petitions with over 450 can I, signatures. Can I just show everybody the 450? What I've been trying to say that my, we got 450 Jill Lowry, South Carolina. We got over 450 signatures about this S5, and Mike voted no. And Josie, you're my representative, and I emailed you about the 450, and you said you had yes votes. Can you tell everybody how many yes votes you had as our representative <coughs> that you feel that you should have voted yes over 450 people on our island? I'll I would finish just with like what to I said on it, Jill. Yeah. Jill is I, so I had that, plus I stopped counting at over 200 emails, text messages, phone calls, face-to-face -face dialogues on this. So somewhere in the realm of 700 to 800 touches of please vote no. Which this. is just over 10% of the district. That's but, and on that one, it was a clear, 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 clear. Of the you also voted no on Pop 5 based on those exact same numbers. Yeah, but Josie, and that wasn't true. Josie, why did what you vote yes true? when we had so many? Mm -hmm. we had, we're asking how many <coughs> of all of us as your representative <coughs> Why did you feel that you're representing us? Why did you vote yes when we had so many no's? Part of being a representative also is weighing 450 people said, don't do this. I probably had at least 300 people say, do this. And at some point, you have to weigh in your own, your own beliefs. So your, yours I, is worth 100? Is that what you're saying? I, I, 450 people, this district is, has. I think OK, so. but that's how many people reached out to you. So if there was more people that were for it, then they should have reached out to you. They didn't. It's not, and a lot of them it's not on the ballot. You want to have a, put it on the ballot? And have a, Come, why didn't you start a petition and send it to her? You could have done it just as easy as she did it. Why didn't you? Start a petition. We have another Very easy, bud. Oh, she's had her hand up for quite a while. They have, and Sean did too, right? Go ahead. I probably forgot what I was going to ask, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly. Could you identify yourselves, everybody, when you speak? Stay in front of the Sorry. No, it's not even good. My name is Wendy Wilton. I'm a Milton resident. Um, I was a legislator many, many, many years ago. Uh, so I have a, I know certainly with the process involved. Um, I mean, I also want to thank you for your vote on S5. I think it was the right thing to do. And Mike and Chris, and Chris also. So the majority of our legislators representing Milton voted no on S5. And I think that's important to know. They listen to the people. That is what their job is. That was my job when I was a legislator, was to listen to my constituents. And I think they heard what people had to say. Why did people say they didn't want our legislators to vote in the affirmative on S5? Why did they tell them the majority obviously voted against it? Why did people in this district say, no to S5. I think a lot of people understood that the legislature was very irresponsible with this bill and that they promoted a plan that has a time frame and a timetable even before the check back occurs in 2025. So it's not really a check back, there's that. But the other problem is that while the state came up with an estimate of about 70 cents a gallon, that estimate was wrong. It was a back of the napkin, which I appreciate Julie Moore was trying to make a point. I believe she was, but she probably didn't have all of the facts available to make a really good estimate and a forecast on what this would be when it's fully implemented, okay? The legislature ran this through the gamut without having those numbers. This is crazy, this is crazy. So instead of producing a study right off the bat to say we want to know what this will be, because there are a lot of factors involved in this, believe me, I come from the financial world. I am the person who did the estimate on single payer health care and predicted it was a $2 billion tax tab. And it wasn't until a year and a half after I produced that estimate that Peter Shumlin agreed that's what it was going to be, even though these people knew that's what it would be. So, here, we had an opportunity to understand what is the fiscal impact of this bill. It was not done. There was no effort. And there was one organization that brought that estimate, a really good estimate, well-founded, with good assumptions, understanding the federal subsidies aren't going to be what people think, understanding that to weatherize a home and put in heat pumps 
is not $10,000, it's more than $45,000. So we go from a billion dollars that have been talked about for this program automatically to four or five billion, especially when you take into consideration that the federal subsidies weren't going to be sufficient. So that means low income Vermonters who live pay paycheck to paycheck, if they didn't have the subsidies there, where were they gonna find the money to do this? Were they gonna borrow it? It's just crazy stuff. So what, what that study showed, and that evidence was given both to the Senate and to the House on this study, and you can find it at ethanallen.org. Okay, that's who did this, this, this study. And the guy who did it is a financial expert. He's done a lot of real estate uh, pro formas and things of that nature, so he understands how to put this together. What he estimated was this wasn't going to be a 70 cent a gallon increase in fuel oil and propane. It was going to be more like $4. Now, we're already paying 4 So that means only two years from now, because I think this lady's right, 2025 isn't that far away. And if this thing gets implemented because there's a, some sort of study which could be flawed, it could be influenced. Why don't you wait and see what the Hold state, on, hold on. I listen to the I listen to the and I'm a Milton resident, you know, it's only two years away and there's steps to implement this thing. So once it's passed, if the veto is overridden, it is on a track. Understand that this is being done without a study. And that is not right. So the study is expected, but it may not be the financial performa that everybody really needs to know. And that is why this bill is so irresponsible. Not only that, but if you want to implement this stuff, um, go find, you have a hard time finding somebody who can actually do the work. How is this going to occur in the few year period that the bill anticipates and that the legislature has wanted to do? I don't see that being practical, that's been pointed out. But also, the uh, ISO New England had a recent meeting and we buy a lot of electricity from Hydro Quebec. And again, electrification has its place. I agree with Mike, you know. Um, I, I put a heat pump in my house. I think it's a great idea. But you can't force people into it by increasing their fuel costs so much that they either have to leave the state or book like fuel from Massachusetts or New Hampshire, right? Or New York State. This is what could happen, folks. <coughs> Here's the really incredible thing. Overarching all of what I just said. As Vermont goes all electric, <coughs> Hydro-Quebec runs short of power. So if Hydro-Quebec is going to run short on power production because of their environmental problems with all the flooding that's going on up there, where will we get the electricity to go electric? It's going to come from Midwestern power plants that are fueled by fossil fuels, folks. Another thing. When you talk about electric, we have to be very careful. That's right. Yes, there are environmental concerns that we need to address, but also there's another concern. Where do we get the heavy metals to run the batteries on a lot of electrical, electric vehicles and other electrical components? I hate to tell you people, and I'm a cell phone user, so some parts of my battery came from some poor child in an African or Asian country who at 10 or 12 years old is mining horrifically dangerous chemicals for us. And I gotta tell you, that breaks my heart every time I think about it. So I think we're rushing headlong with S5. We're going too far too fast. It is not a well thought out bill and we do not have the numbers. It is irresponsible for the legislature to pass this. And I really hope those of you who voted yes will think about this long and hard and reverse your vote and sustain the veto. That is all I have. Yeah. Last year, the Joint Fiscal Office stated it is too soon to estimate the impact of Vermont's economy, households, and businesses. The way in which clean heat standards are implemented, including the way in which clean heat credits are priced, and how incentives and subsidies are offered to households and businesses must be established before meaningful analysis is possible. At the same time, those incentives or subsidies could be costly to the state, suggesting larger fiscal impacts in future years. That's exactly what Wendy was saying. And yeah, thank you for your, your thoughts on that, Wendy. Gabrielle, I'm wondering if you want to talk a little bit about um, 
Actually, that's studies question. that yeah, are going to. Yeah. to yeah. I, I think I think questions from the folks are take precedent oh, over that personally, but. Yeah. She's from part of this community. She's from Burlington. So she's working. And look how this is for this is for the Milton community. Milton. It's, 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 it's not matter. Burlington. She doesn't know what's going on. Actually, I got a question for her. Burlington, you're kidding me. Hey, excuse me. It's not Burlington. Raise your hand like you said. The bad speller. Raise his hand. Oh, sure. Thank you. Good job. Now, I want everybody here to know Berlin one thing about me right now. Be quiet, please, folks, so we can ask should, the question. We should let the, let the questions ask if there's time. The first thing I want everybody to know is I own a heating company. My family's owned a heating company for 75 years in the state. I take pride in what I do in my customers. And this bill does scare me. But the question I have for, I don't remember your name. Gabrielle. Gabrielle yes. is. Is there any part of this bill that you can sit here and tell me that doesn't tell the oil company they need to get rid of their customers by making them go to electric heat? It does not say that. Is it, so there's no part of that bill that says, in order for you to get credits to sell your oil, you have to get your customers off fuel oil, fossil fuels. It does not say that. Tell me what the bill says. Okay. I'm going to give you your opportunity. Thank you. And thank you, by the way. Because I heat, I have oil heat, and when I call Toronto Fuels, January 15th, and I need a refill, they come up any time of day. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, I love heat pumps. I was on the news not too long ago telling you, I love heat pumps, but it is not <coughs> going to cure our problems. So it, I'm not saying it won't help with climate change. I'm not saying it's not real. I guarantee you climate change is real. I believe it. Right. How do you stop it? Well, I think and we have to. Like no, 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 it's all on a rational. We can't kill the fossil fuels. We can't combustion is causing it. But we can't kill the gas. Sorry, go ahead, Gabrielle. So I just want to say, um, you know, I I know a lot of people who've installed heat pumps, and I know a lot of people who drive electric vehicles. I can't deal with your talking. He's got a he has a hearing problem. He can't hear anybody. <laughs> I know a lot of people who drive electric vehicles or have heat pumps. Um, generally, it's not the lower and the moderate income Vermonters who are doing that, uh, and it's because it does take money to do that work. And so. Uh, Really, the focus of the, this, this bill is looking bigger picture. We know that we are seeing, New York State just passed a law that bans fossil fuel equipment by 2036. We know we're seeing more electric vehicles. We're even starting to see electric trucks. We okay, but I asked you what the bill is telling me about. I will. I, I need well, to explain that's what I'm hoping she'll get to. I don't from. care about the other stuff. I just want to know how it's going to affect the fuel dealers. Where the bill came from is a concern that the market outside of Vermont and the entire US, the entire world is shifting. And if we don't have something in place to try and figure out how to make this doable for people who right now can't afford to make other choices, <coughs> then those are the Vermonters who are gonna be most left behind. So I just wanna say that is the background behind where this came from. I also want to say we've been studying this for 20 years, since 2006. We had a governor in 2006, a Republican governor, who was the first governor who started a climate council. Yes, this has climate impacts, but ultimately it's actually, I mean, there are other things we could do that would address climate uh, probably more quickly than this bill, because this bill is a gradual plan. So you asked for what's in the bill. I asked what was going to interfere with fuel companies being able to get their fuel. What does a fuel company, let's say I'm, I'm just going to throw out a name, let's say Hart and Meads in Hinesburg, been here since 1941, doesn't have a service company, so they don't clean furnaces, they don't do any of that, I actually do their work, but they don't have one that they employ. How are they going to be able to buy fuel now? What's the process for them if this law is implemented? What this law implements is three things. This is all it does. One, it creates a clean heat standard. Two, over the next year and a half, the Public Utility Commission and um, our utility companies, so Vermont Gas, fuel dealers, 
Uh, all of those folks work for a year and a half to develop the rules and the regulations of what this program could look like. And then what happens in January of 2025 is all of this is brought back to the legislature. Okay, but you're still not no, telling me Let me finish, answers. sir, please. You've gone through the whole bill. No, I have to finish. Sean, let me finish. Just give her another minute, okay? On or before January 15, 2025, <coughs> the commission shall submit a written report and provide oral testimony to the House Committee on Environment and Energy and the Senate Committees on Finance and on Natural Resources and Energy detailing the efforts undertaken to establish a clean heat standard. The report shall include, to the extent available, and with all due respect, what you said, ma'am, is completely incorrect. To the extent available. <laughs> no, listen, listen. We're listening. I'm still waiting for the answer to my question. She's not going to give you an answer. She's, She's typical. Give answer. She's skirt around it. Let us speak. Skirt. Estimates of the impact of the clean heat standard on customers, really? including impacts to customer rates Small. and fuel bills for participating and non-participating customers. That basically means like customers who don't want to do weatherization or don't want to do a heat pumps. So this has to look at what this bill could, look, could cost uh, come January 2025 if the legislature in two years decides to vote the program forward. And also, the net impacts on total spending on energy for thermal sector, that's heating sector, and uses. What it would reduce in fossil fuels, <coughs> what the greenhouse gas emission reductions are, and what types of economic activity or employment impacts there might be. So this bill really, um, it, it, it is not a study. I totally, I believe I was the one who said it on the floor. I, my comparison of this bill is when I get in the car for a family vacation, we pack, we pack, pack the minivan up. Kids are in the car. My dog's in the car. House is locked. We can't turn the car, car on. We actually can't turn the car on. What this bill does is say, we know we've been studying this for 20 years. We know who's going to get hit the hardest. If we keep seeing the war in Ukraine, if we keep seeing oh, other oh, things go on, if we keep seeing fuel prices go up and down, and leave no other choices, what would this cost? And essentially, it brings it back to the legislature in 2025 to say, this is what this program could look like. You will not see a change from this program in the next year and a half on your fuel bills. You might see other but changes. But that's not what I asked you. She did answer that. No, she didn't. She did not so answer did. What no, is no, how no. the fuel companies are buying their fuel. How will they, if this is enacted, how are they going to buy their fuel? Sure That's what I asked. They would still buy it. The same How? How? <laughs> well, they buy it through credits that, like, say I put in a heat pump. Yeah. From what I, maybe I'm wrong, but just let me know. If I put in a heat pump, say during this bill, I'm going to get a credit myself because I'm the installer. And I can sell those credits back to the fuel company that they can purchase credits to buy fuel with. Is that correct? Yes or no? So if you are a fuel company installing a heat pump? No, if I'm me. Sean, I'm not a fuel company, I'm an installer. Just an installer, I don't sell fuel. I put a heat pump on the wall in here, I register it online, yeah. you give me a certain amount of credits, however they work out to be. I then take those credits and I can be, sell them to other fuel companies <coughs> that sell fuel. Does that sound right? You could if you wanted to. But that's what it is, right? If I choose not to, then Correct. what do I do with those credits? It's, it's a part of the bill, yes. If you want to do that, you can. The okay. concept behind this bill is to provide more choices. Now, is there a cap on those credits? Well, Meaning that's part of the if I year and a half to look at. So, I could technically say, I don't. How much is a credit in gallons? Is that is part of the next year and a half. Okay, so you're going to find out how many gallons. So, that's if it's a gallon, let's just say a gallon per credit. I know that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And I want to sell my credit to them for four dollars. They're going to now pay four dollars for a credit to buy fuel. I'm They're not going to be able to go. I'm not going to say yes to that because that's part of the design. That is why we're looking at this. Well, you've got so to have these answers if we're going to do a bill. If we're going to make something a law, you should make it. You should know these answers already. No, you can't say you want to study it, but then you don't want to look at it. That's what this is. It's looking at it to try and figure it's out. It's not looking what at it before it's voted into the legislature 
and it's kind of a big question mark. Do you want to come back to it? Hopefully this time we will be able to do it. Everybody, let's get some other Let's get some new I'm thinking man in the red shirt. To the representative who said that I was wrong. And i tell you why I'm right. And that is that when this bill went to the Senate Appropriations Committee, Dick Sears, who I worked with, I was on Senate Judiciary, um, and he's a pretty smart guy. He's been around a long time. And uh, he looked at this bill. Now, I know in the end he voted for it on the floor. But he voted against it in committee for the very reason that I stated. There are dates in this bill that set up actions that are ready to go long before 2025. Yeah. He also said, and I can explain why. Go, let me speak. So he also said, and this was this goes beyond the dates that are set up in the bill. He perceived and he understood that even if there's a check back in a study, it doesn't protect people in this bill because it lays the whole foundation and the bill is ready as a turnkey uh, when 2025 comes and the decision is made. So he understood that, he perceived it, and that is the reason he voted against it in the committee. So understand this, and understand that, you know, uh, Dick Sears is pretty much a horse trader, right? So he, he figured he'd vote for it on the floor. But he, but he is the linchpin as to whether or not the veto will be sustained, okay? So the question is, why did he say those things in Senate Appropriations Committee where he said, I'm concerned that this check back is not really a check back, and it's a real concern that this bill is going to be in law, and there will be no way to reverse this, and this is on a track, and yet the study has not been done. And I'm simplifying this, and I'm paraphrasing it. What I'm telling you is, technically, someone may be correct about an interpretation, but this is a guy who's very wise, he's been around a long time, and he had those questions. And we all have those questions. And it is because of Senator Sears that it says, the commission shall not file the final proposed rules with the Secretary of State until specific authorization is enacted by the General Assembly to do so. And so that is what resolved, and that is why he voted yes on the floor, is because that is in there. Man in the red. Vote again. So um, I'm Pat Haller. I live in Westford. Um, <coughs> From what I understand from S5, uh, to answer your question, Sean, uh, there are seven measures that are uh, uh, part of the credits. Only two of them have to do with heat pump installation. Uh, the rest are weatherization, um, solar hot water heater, and I forget the others. But there's only two. The other five, you can still get credits for doing it, those. Basically, it's making your house more efficient yes. to do things, whether it's you know, doors and windows, yep. but, but are we expe really expecting things yeah. yeah. oh, Sorry. So um, many of the people who have, who have spoken up and said, well, I've installed a heat pump. Um, they're not $45,000. Weatherizing a house is not $45,000. A lot of this work that we're doing uh, is to reduce costs. A heat pump, if you're going to introduce a heat pump, is going to reduce your costs. Weatherization is going to reduce costs. We're trying to reduce costs. We're trying to reduce <coughs> fossil fuel use. We're trying to reduce CO2 emissions. The Public Utilities Commission are going to be the ones that come up with the rules. That's this right. bill is essentially authorizing the Public Utility Commission to do what they've been doing for the other efficiency programs, Efficiency Vermont, Vermont Gas, BED, uh, so I think they're in a great position to do that. We need to start moving away from fossil fuel, and this provides a market that the likes of you, Sean, and others can actually work in, whereas in the past, when I wanted to uh, change my, my uh, furnace system, I would ask my fuel dealer, and the fuel dealer, if they didn't have someone, they'd just send me to someone else. That someone else would sell me a 78% uh, efficient fossil fuel uh, piece of equipment that then was costing me more money per gallon because it was an inefficient fossil fuel piece of equipment. So I think we need to move forward. This is a great way to move forward. It's providing a market that hasn't existed for those people who are playing in the fossil fuel market and delivery market. So I think it expands your market as opposed to restricts your market. 
I personally have to disagree with that because you're asking guys who are in a trade that do fuel to you're asking them to expand into doing insulation of a home and stuff like that. That's not what I, I'm 49 years old. That's the last thing I want to do is go into somebody's house and start insulating your house. You got bug <coughs> insulation, other people doing that. You're going to create a problem where you're taking from Peter to pay Paul. You're, you're going to spread it out wrong. Shen, with all due respect, the, the business model of delivering fuel is to get the most fuel out there for the largest profit margin. That's just the way capitalism works. Absolutely. We I'm need to change that business. Your business model is already changing. So why not do what you do to natural gas with oil? You restrict the price of gas on fuel oil and kerosene and propane. You hold it just like they do. Just like Green Mountain Power can't charge you a higher rate unless you go through the service board to get approval. Do that with fuel oil and kerosene. Don't go telling people they got to do something they don't have to do. Right. Don't force it on. Because we all know a heat pump, sir, is $5,000 per unit. One heat pump in here to heat this place, six, seven grand right here. You know what the rebates are right now? You must know, right? You know what they are? Probably around 700 bucks. 700 bucks. So now that, that single parent, mother of four maybe, mother of two, or that 80 year old person now has to come up with four or five grand out of their pocket for one. And that don't even heat their rooms. So you're talking 15 to $20,000 on average to convert a two bedroom house to heat pumps. So, so remember, it's not just heat pumps. Mm -hmm. I know it's not just heat pumps, but that's what, when you the attack measure. the fossil fuel industry, you're attacking the, the oil guys. You're not just, I you're talking know. heat pumps. There are other folks who had you, you in the back. You've had your hand up for a while, yeah. please. My name is Lisa Reese. Hi, John. Hi. Wendy. Um, so we talk about constituents and about how dare you vote against your constituents. Well, I can tell you that, yes, you got a petition. I, that, that's great. That's what you do, right? You get a petition and you say, we don't like this. But what has happened is that sometimes voices that are contrary get really squashed through <laughs> people who send abusive or very vitriolic emails that can intimidate you. So what has happened in Milton over the last decades is that the Democrats, and I am a Democrat. Head of the Democrat have, Party in Yes, I am. Like when Democratic of the Party, Republican by the way. Party. Yeah. The Democratic so Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyhow, that's my husband, Grant. Um, and really what has happened is that we have forgotten what dialogue is all about. Because when I just say, could we look at this bill? Because, sir, as you said, that and, and you as well, is that it's a study. So 20 years in the making, 20 years we've been working on this. Well, let me tell you, I worked 35 years for immigration. We still haven't solved the immigration sure. problem. And it's well, still not. Well, that. But I'm just <laughs> saying. I'm just saying. It doesn't. About two million people were like, yeah. What I am saying. Right is that, is that if we don't start somewhere, that's all I'm saying, somewhere to address what's going on globally, because it's true, Sean, you said climate change is real. And I know there's a lot of fear. I don't want to pay on a retiree's income $2 or $4 more a gallon. Nobody does. What I am saying is that as a community and as Milton, and as for Mont, and somebody emailed me like, it doesn't matter. You know, look at India and China, you're right. It really seems funny, doesn't it? Like, look at the world. But well, we can be the beacon. We can be the ones that at least can the look into it. The second smallest population in the country we can be the beacon. We can look That's into right. it. We can have the courage to say, Vermont, look at Irene, what you said about you know, making sure that there's drugs available to us. And you know, that's who we are. So why can't we at least study it? It says in the language that it's still there's turnkey. And I get it. There's still more that needs to be done. But if we continue to do this, then we're never going to fix this problem. And our grandkids are the ones, Sean, hold on. And I'm just saying that it's really difficult to find your voice in Milton mm -hmm. for anything contrary or any dialogue to have in a normal way because you just can't and it's tiring. Well, I'm going to give you dialogue. I'm just saying sure. that we just need to at least give these people our food. There are constituents, I can tell you, 
Milton's purple. And I can tell you there's a lot of people who do support this. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> So if it's just a study, why don't we veal the bill and just do a study bill? Strictly let study. Let everyone have a voice. Folks, we got, we, got, we got less than 15 minutes. Are there any other subjects? I don't want to, I'm not trying to squash it. I just, but I told y'all up front. Let's hear some new voices. I got another topic. Well, hang on, she's had her hand up too. We'll go her and then you, okay? And then that should, I think, probably yeah, close us out. That'll close us out. Yeah. And then we'll put the chairs away from the library. R. Kennedy, Grand Isle. And thank you, Jody, and others of you who voted to do this bill in terms of making it possible to start somewhere. And I just want to say, Someone back here who spoke much earlier said they had a new grandchild this morning. Before we came here, we got on my awful cell phone <laughs> and watched our youngest grandchild graduate from college. This bill <coughs> is about the future of our children, our grandchildren, and perhaps our great-grandchildren, should our grandchildren, and so far all of ours have said they're not going to have children, but our grand great-grandchildren, for those who have the courage to have them, it's about their future, and we need, if we really care about kids, we need to start doing those little steps that collectively we can do. Thank you. Can I change this? Can I change this? This is boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. S203, S I believe, was a bill. 230. 230? Yeah. yeah. You're talking the suicide prevention the, the bill? Suicide prevention bill. Yeah. I'm just curious to the members in here. Uh, how, how you came about voting to pass this when in the last 10 years there was 440,000 dick checks in the state of Vermont and only two actual people committed suicide the day they bought their gun. And now you folks have chosen to shove on to us that are lawful gun owners. We've got to wait three days now in order to pick up the firearm that we purchased. I just wondered what the rationale was. Maybe nobody in this room was on that committee or voted on it or whatever. I, I can we talk all, a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, everybody voted on it. It's yeah. been on the House and the Senate. Yeah. Um, so thank you for your question. Um, I was trying to get a turkey down. The uh, House Health Care spent a tremendous amount of time on this. Um, and I sat down. Um, with the chair of health, House Health Care before coming here, <coughs> and she said that they took testimony from people that were, it's more than two, they took testimony from actually four people, and that's just the people that came in, or about their family members, because their family members committed suicide. Um, and that's just the people that came in. So I think it's ambiguous uh, how many people have, she said that they don't have good numbers on that. Um, but here's some things I can tell you. Um, in 2012, there were 86 suicides in Vermont. Uh, 56 of them were by firearm. In 2020, 117 Vermonters killed themselves, 76 with firearms. And in 2021, we hit, um, sadly, a high watermark of suicides in our state with 142 people. 80, 83 of them were with firearms. Uh, she also told me that 90% of gun deaths that happen in Vermont are suicides. So there's kind of two bills that are going around that they're, the healthcare had worked on that are going through the process. The companion bill to S230 is, uh, I forget what the number of 481. 481. And so last year, um, the legislature compelled uh, the, the administration <coughs> to hire a person who is 
a suicide prevention uh, person at the Department of Health. And so 481 has empowers that person to look at what are clearly our rising numbers of suicide are in the state and come up with a statewide suicide prevention plan. So that's working on a kind of different aspect of suicide prevention. And then S230 is looking at the means of suicide, which um, you know, certainly not all completed suicides are gun deaths, but I think those numbers speak for themselves that we need to do something to reduce those numbers. So that's where that comes from. <laughs> There's, that seems to be hush. You don't hear that anywhere. It's on, and that's just Burlington, you know, God only knows worldwide. But it's this, this gun thing, like I said, it, it seemed to come after me. I, I'm being punished because someone chooses to take their life with a firearm. But yet, yeah. we're letting people go test their drugs yeah. before they take them. Right. Yeah, to make sure they're safe. Well, that's one way to address the fentanyl issue. Mm -hmm. How about don't do drugs? They're illegal. So even though you make something illegal, how is somebody not? I just don't get it. It makes zero sense to me. Yeah. If they're illegal, why are we helping them right. to do illegal stuff? Done. It's simple. That's that's the dumbest thing Done. I've ever heard. Done. Last question. Uh, Dylan Welch from uh, Crosstown in Milton. Just gotta say, uh, we've tried. We've tried making things illegal before prohibition and the war on drugs and both failed spectacularly. Oh, sorry about the jacket. So I don't see how saying something is illegal necessarily means that it's their fault that they died from it. Well it didn't prevent it either, right? So so why make laws? In fact the reason that the reason that they're dying from fentanyl is because the drugs are illegal. They're being caught with fentanyl because there is no regulation for them. Because if you're caught with it, you just get locked up, or well, or released in Tenton County. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So still, then the same thing you said about crime. the gun law. <coughs> will this um, will this gun bill? I'm just sorry to interrupt. Will this H two thirty? Will it prevent everybody from killing themselves with a gun? No. Not at all. Will it prevent anybody who has a gun from killing themselves? No, but Sean... I understand. I, no, that's what I was looking for just now. What it will do is it will prevent someone... From buying a gun and who's then under the age of 26, whose mm -hmm. frontal lobe has not fully developed and don't understand long-term consequences. Did and that work, work for the guy at Peros? Yeah, exactly. What? Yeah. Peros incident. I'm sure you've heard about it. No. He walked in there, took a class for an hour, rented a gun, blew his brain right out inside the oh. gun range, committed suicide. I didn't hear about that. I can't speak to that, Sean. I just well, know. Well, if this law was in place, <coughs> would that have prevented it? Well, he, he rented the no. gun. He didn't buy the gun. Exactly. No, but he can. So that's what I'm he saying. You're going to get more people street. are going to start doing things differently. Sean, Sean. Sean. Yeah. three days. It's asking you. Three days. All right. I don't, am I yeah. arguing with three days? Is three days persecution? Yeah. 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 That's our right to do it. It's our right. It's our right. We had yes. uncles and parents right that here. fought for rights. They fought for the Second Amendment within three days. Peter, no. three days. Everyone. Second Amendment. No. I would just like to thank all of you in Milton. These are hard discussions. These are incredibly important discussions. I write down notes. I pay attention. And I thank you all for coming and so, coming so consistently and on uh, yet another beautiful day. So let's go, let's thank you everyone for speaking. Well, I want to thank you before you thank everybody else <laughs> for, for saying that there is a year and a half analysis of the details of the implementation of this bill we talked about. Now that was news to me, it was to anybody else. And there'll be time for public hearings, I assume. Yes, yes. For people to be how it would affect the way <coughs> And there will be, I will be having at some point this summer or this fall a Learn About S5 forum. I'll be bringing in experts. I will invite all of you. I have your emails. And thank you all for coming. And let's put the chairs back. Thank you, the reps, Michael, Chris, Chris, Irene. Yes. Oh, I want to be a good one.